It is springtime and it's bud break in Napa Valley. Tonight we are going to dissect what does bud break mean and we have Shana Harding and Natalie Coglin of Gadarian Wines. Literally, it translates to let's gather. So let's gather and let's get it started. This is SIP episode 88. So we are marching steadfastly towards 100 episodes, and then we'll see what happens beyond that. But 88 times you've allowed us into your living homes, your campers, your lanais, your back patios, and, and we are forever grateful for that. I did want to uh, continue welcoming Susan J. Peter. I know Peter is in Chicago, so uh, say hello to Peter. Where uh, Peter, I don't know what the temperature is these days in Chicago, but I would imagine it's not the same as, as it is in Napa and or Florida or Arizona. So thank you for joining us. I lost everyone. There we go. Uh, I want to talk tonight a little bit about what we began discussing last week, quite honestly, Greek philosophy, which I know Natalie and Shana had no idea that we were going to be discussing Greek philosophy. But it is important to us because Seller Angels, people ask, and by the way, my name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Seller Angels, a direct-to-consumer online wine company focusing exclusively on Napa and Sonoma wines that you really can't get in the public place. And one of the reasons why we wanted to focus on this, which we started in 2010, is to help the limited production wineries. So these are the small wineries that are making absolutely exquisite wines. But because of their size and where they're starting, they don't make a lot of it. It is precious, precious stuff. And you're going to hear this this evening how they source the fruit. And we're going to talk about Bud Break, which you were going to have a perfect example of behind me, because like spring in Chicago, this is the vines are starting to come to life. And it's letting people know climatically that, OK, winter is, is subsiding into the into the past and now we can start getting ready for spring. It might be a little early for winemakers to see the bud break right now because they kind of like a little bit of the down slowness of the winter season. But we started Cellar Angels, honestly, 12 years ago to change the world. And, and that is not, I don't say that lightly. We sat down and wanted to change the world one wine drinker at a time. And to do that requires, in my opinion, heroes. And so I want to talk a little bit about heroes because this is where the Greek philosophy comes in. 2,000 years ago, heroes in Aristotle's time, it's not a person from Marvel or a superhero or a cape or anything like that. These people were protectors and defenders, and they had the strength of two. And the nice thing about a protector and a defender is that's what Stellar Angels customers are doing. You sipsters are actually protecting and defending the small limited production winery. You want them to succeed just as much as we do. And you are, in fact, the wine hero. So if you go into Wikipedia and if you go into, you know, your uh, dictionary, if they still have paper dictionaries, and actually there's an asterisk that says C Sipsters. So uh, I don't know how that got into Wikipedia. I'm thankful for it. But uh, you folks are re the reason why we do this. And the reason why we do this also is to meet and introduce you to people like Natalie and Shana. So I want to raise a glass to the two of them who are taking some time out on a Friday night uh, with children breaking down the doors and wondering what mom is doing. Uh, so Natalie and Shana, it is so good to see you both again. And thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening. Cheers. Thank you for having us. <laughs> no problem. The, the neat thing about what we do is getting to learn your stories and sharing your stories with everyone. So talk to me a little bit about and I know, Shana, I'll start with you because you have a, a wine career. You've been in the Valley a while. You two knew each other and, and apparently you sent her a text. Yeah, so um, I had been making wine in Napa for uh, quite a while for other people, um, which is great. But I really wanted to have a, a project where I could make wine to very selfishly kind of make me happy, you know? And um, Natalie and I had kind of been wine buddies for a while. Um, sometimes her and her husband would come up to Napa and we'd go tasting or we'd, we'd drink this and that. And um, uh, when I decided that I, I really wanted to start my own brand, um, I sent a text to Natalie and was like, hey, remember when we kind of talked about uh, <laughs> making wine before? Or are you interested in uh, starting a wine brand with me? And uh, she uh, texted me back right away and said, did you mean to send this to me? <laughs> <laughs> I 
That is hysterical. The, the errant text that says potential spam, but it actually had Shana's name on it this time. <laughs> yes, comma, I'm in, but did you mean to send this to me? <laughs> And, and because I don't want Shana to tell too much of her backstory before we get into her backstory, I'm going to launch the first poll question. And by the way, on Monday's quiz that went on to the email blast about the two favorite things for each of them, we all know Matt, Natalie's favorite thing is actually punch downs because Natalie, I think if I remember last time from September, you like the resistance of using your arms because it feels like swimming, but it is actually much more difficult it's it's the closest to swimming through wine that you could possibly get and it's really cool so i get to use um the skills of sculling um that i've learned from swimming and take it into winemaking which is really fun awesome okay so prior to arriving in wine country shana actually led a pit crew in nascar true or false she was from florida she was from florida so there's two things you do in Florida. You, apparently, we found out in the, in the prep, you throw gang symbols and or <laughs> you have some affiliation with NASCAR. I am going to give this five, four, three, two, one. Interesting. Uh, a little bit of split. What is the correct answer, Shana? No, unfortunately, I did not lead a pit crew in <laughs> Surprised to see this question. That would have been so cool. I wish that, I did. How badass would I, that be? Oh. I like how she says, unfortunately. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, so you that would have been pretty badass, huh? Yeah. <laughs> There's still time. So what did you do before Florida? I'm sorry, before wine. Before wine, um, so for a while, I was um, in the service industry, so I worked in restaurants, um, which is where I was introduced to wine. Um, when I lived in New York. I worked for the Be Our Guest Restaurant Group and um, was able to attend their wine college, um, which was led by um, Laura Manick, who was a female master psalm. At the time, she was the only master psalm um, that was in, in New York, and I was super impressed with her. I gobbled up as much information as I could from her. Um, but I was, I was bartending and, and selling wine in a restaurant pretty much. And then, um, I ended up doing some, some work in finance when I finally got a real job. Um, and, and I was at Standard & Poor's when I came out to San Francisco and it was just, it's one of the, it, it didn't, it didn't really click for me. It was, it was not awesome. And I loved wine so much that, uh, I decided to take a leap and see if somebody would hire me in wine country. And luckily, uh, they did. And then, after that, I went back to school and kept working in wine, in wine and I've been doing it ever since. So it's been, uh, last year was my 14th harvest. I was just going to ask, what year was your first year in wine country officially working? In harvest 2008, I did the sparkling wine harvest at Domaine Chandon. And then as soon as that harvest was done, I, I took a full-time role at Clopagas in Calistoga. Oh, wow. And because we don't want Natalie to feel left out, she too has a poll question. <laughs> So get your fingers ready for poll question number two. Prior to Natalie answering the text that Shana just told us about with yes, she was A, a finalist on Celebrity Chef, B, did some swimming things on television, <laughs> C, was a competitive show horse rider, or D, worked in NASCAR where she met Shana. I wish that was true. <laughs> 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 that is awesome. Okay, so everyone knows your story. Oh, hey, yeah. we've got two, apparently two people do not. <laughs> what is my mom doing on the broadcast? Mom. <laughs> All right, so, and I don't want to, you know, minimize this, but Natalie, I know you weren't a celebrity chef, but I think you probably could be if you wanted to do a competitive, oh, actually, you could be a celebrity chef. You <laughs> are right now a celebrity chef, yeah. <laughs> What's a celebrity um, chef anyway? <laughs> what is a celebrity? Correct. So tell us a little bit about your background. So my background in a former life, um, Olympic swimmer. I went to Athens, Beijing, and London Olympics. Um, I earned 12 medals, three gold, four silver, five bronze. So um, I thought that's where you're we going with uh, the Greek mythology. Uh, my first Olympics was in Athens. <laughs> that would have been... <laughs> A, a very shrewd host would have done that. 
This it would have been a good segue and you missed, you missed your opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so. <laughs> I'll write that in my, uh, <laughs> my, my, my comments, comments afterwards. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's, that's where, um, yeah, my, I was a professional athlete for 12, 15 years or so. Um, and yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago now, uh, that I've been out of it for maybe five years uh, officially or so. <laughs> uh, and by the way, Rowdy Gaines, I actually invited him to tonight's episode on Twitter. He liked my tweet. So oh, that would have been great, Rowdy. You're missing out. <laughs> but I don't see him in the in the attendee list, so he's dead to us. Um, <laughs> no, he's actually also impressive. And I again, I don't want to minimize. It's funny because when you're on that starting block, when when the gun goes off, everyone has the same destination. But the route they all took to get to the starting block is wildly different. And and just the amount of persistence and patience and practice and love both of you have uh, for this and in the prior careers and, and what you're doing now forward coming with Guderian is fantastic. So Natalie, I'd love you to walk us through the name Guderian. So Guderian means to gather in old English. And so when Shannon and I partnered together, uh, naming our new winery was it was very, very challenging. And we didn't want it just to be our names or anything like that. So we thought, hey, what do you do when you have a great bottle of wine? You gather with friends and family around a table with food and um, looking up different versions of gather or to gather or bring together in uh, the dictionary in every language I could think of. Gadarian just seems so perfect. And so that's what uh, we stuck with. I, I love it. It's, it's funny. We say we have a bunch of sayings at Cellar Angels, and one of them is wine brings people together. So clearly it, it works perfectly. We also like to say we drink serious wines. We just don't take ourselves too seriously. So it, it's, it's a very important thing. And the winery, Shana, is how old? So our brand started a harvest or excuse me, vintage 2017. So uh, 2021 was our fifth year. Um, so big milestone for us. Um, so we're, we're still very young uh, wine brand and in the process of growing. And we started with just the Pinot Noir um, that you're tasting. Of course, it was the 17 vintage um, that we started with and um, Chenin Blanc. And that was our full production the first year. And then um, in 2018, we added on uh, Rosé and Chardonnay. And we now also have um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and a red wine blend. So um, we, we've got our full, for, full portfolio of wines now that we can share with people when they come visit us. I like it. And you actually said red wine blend. And in the trivia question in the email on Monday, we all learned that Natalie's favorite pastime was punch downs. Shana's favorite thing to do is blending. So Jim B in Colorado, B is for bocce because he's quite a bocce player. Um, kind of, I think, what do they call those guys? Ringers that just fool you to think that they don't have any skills. And then all of a sudden they just start taking money. Mm -hmm. That's Jim. Um, <laughs> but Jim got the, the trivia question correct because he knew that you liked blending from the last episode in September. Well, and if what Jim's ever in St. Helena, I'm on a bocce league. Uh, so, you know, we could use help from a ringer. Uh <laughs> Absolutely. And Jim is actually a frequent visitor to wine country. I know I, he may be out and Bill, his friend, may be out rather soon. I think in the next three or four weeks. I also know he'll be back out when the Angels invade wine country in July for, for a week. Nice. So we'll be out there with a bunch of people as well. Very cool. uh, so what is it about blending that you love? So it's it's kind of this culmination. Uh, you, you, you have all these inputs in winemaking from, from the site selection to the pick decision to your barrel decision. Um, what do you wanna do during fermentation? How do you wanna age your wine? All these things. And then at the end of the day, you have all of these uh, components. So whether it's just uh, barrel variation or you're trying to blend together different varietals and, and you're taking um, little pieces of everything and then you take you can take something that's already hopefully quite good and make it even better by by working on making the perfect blend something that is going to have a beautiful start a lovely glide through your palate and then a nice link 
finish. And so you can accomplish uh, a lot of nuance by just making small blending tweaks when you're um, finalizing your wines before you bottle. I would imagine that's a little bit nerve wracking. And so Natalie, when, when you're doing the blending and from a decision-making standpoint, do you both start with a blank slate and let the fruit dictate where you're gonna go? Or do you kind of start with an end project in mind and then pick the fruit to match what you're going after? Well, I know for me, um, I, I mean, you, we're a young brand and I'm definitely very young to this. Um, and so I defer to Shana on the major, major decisions. And especially with blending, I'm still, uh, I haven't had that much experience with it. So I defer to Shana's ex uh, expertise in that. Um, but I definitely have gained a, a bit of more confidence of like what I, I know I really love. So for instance, with our, uh, 2019 Cabernet, we used French Oak and we used American Oak. And when we were doing, um, the blending trials with that, like I, I love, love, love what the American Oak adds to that Cabernet. Um, and, uh, so I, I know what I want our end product to look to, to look like or taste like. Um, and it's really, really cool to see how these little components um, or not so little components add to that final product. Um, so I love like the herbaceousness that you get from that American oak um, that you don't necessarily get from the French oak. Let me just no, chime in ahead. here too to say Natalie is being very modest. <laughs> Excellent palette and she has a wonderful sense memory too. So like uh, going back, like especially with the Pinot Noir, you know, since we've been making that 17, 18, 19, 21, um, and, and is able to kind of compare and contrast all of our vintages and help me to make uh, decisions for how we want to go about making uh, wine in the next vintage that we can continuously up our game and, and make the best wine possible. And she's really great at that. And she's just being very modest. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a good student. And I like to practice. <laughs> <laughs> don't we all is right and I think Shana what you said too as far as memory sense that's impressive because if you can not only store that memory away but then equally importantly recall it to say oh I know what this is I know what that is that, that's a huge skill it, it's I think the, the biggest part of that skill is putting like a verbal word to it because that way you could really like lock it away in your memory so adding like actual verbal descriptors is a really good way to have that sense memory and like build that. Like if you just, if you don't add um, a few descriptors, it'll just kind of disappear. And you're like, oh, this tastes like, this tastes like, this tastes like, and you're like oregano. And then someone else says oregano. And you're like, yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so you need to like come up with a few um, actual verbal descriptors and that'll help you um, it, or help, it helps me at least. That's actually a good point. And there's a lot of memory experts that talk about the word you need to memorize. You also have to have associations with that word so that you can remember the association, then it triggers the memory of the word. So that's a perfect process for doing that. For those of you that don't know how many of the people in the audience right now are drinking the 2018 Pinot Noir, it's because they went to the Cellar Angels website and actually acquired a sip kit. So the SIP kit will have the next four wines for the next four Friday events. And you order it, it gets sent to your house and you sit back with two incredible souls that are drinking wine and made the wine and are educating us on the wine. We're drinking the Guderian 2018 Pinot Noir. Uh, there is not much of it left. I think there's yeah, 17 bottles. So uh, we're gonna get deep into the, the wine in a bit, but what we do wanna talk about in our SIP educational series tonight, as I mentioned at the top is bud break. So behind me, we, we have that little sign of spring that because these, well, Shane of Florida had some New York in her, Natalie, basically California. This is a sure sign of life is coming back to survival in from Chicago, New York and the winter months and stuff. Uh, it'll still be gray and dingy and snow for about three more months in Chicago with the piles from plowing that are still in the parking lots and stuff like that for seemingly forever. But Shana, talk to us a little bit about, you know, the vines go through this dormancy stage and it doesn't matter how much rain you get or anything like that. They're just kind of shut down. But then in, in the early, it's starting to warm up now earlier and we have bud break throughout the valley. But I want to know what does that signify and how do the different varietals 
open and have bud break at different times? So um, certain varietals are considered later ripening or earlier ripening varietals, and that directly correlates to when they have bud break in most cases. So right now in the Napa Valley, the vines that have bud break are the Chardonnay vines. There may be a few other varietals where there's a few vines that have, have bud break, but um, everyone that I've spoken to, everything that I've seen so far, it's just Chardonnay um, in Napa at least. Um, and that tends to be earlier ripening and um, earlier harvest. People are often gonna be harvesting their Chardonnays in September where something like the Cabernet Sauvignons, Merlots, those are gonna be in October usually here. So um, our Pinot Noir is close to bud break. We have bud swelling happening in the vineyard where uh, this Pinot Noir is from. Um, so we are really a matter of maybe five days away from bud break, six days away, I think. Uh, okay. Yeah, so um, hopefully um, once we have bud break, we don't have any hard freezes. That's uh, always a concern, you know, because we don't want any any damage when the vines are at their most vulnerable. So as soon as the buds shoot, there are these fresh little green um, the leaves that are that are they're babies really. They're juveniles and they can't withstand the um, the really cold temperatures. So if we get bud break too early, there's a risk. Uh, bud break late, then the risk is just, you know, it's going to take a long time to ripen and then we bump up into fire season or rainy season. Um, this so is it's interesting. Let me just back up for a second because yeah. you have Chardonnay that is already going through bud break and yeah. Pinot is close behind and Chardonnay yeah. and Pinot are both cool weather grapes. So mm -hmm. they should, you would think, kind of have bud break in close proximity to each other. And then that's when it sounds like the the danger and susceptibility can happen because now the, the bud is exposed and like you said you could have a hard frost that's not good then right. you have what's the next demarcation or life cycle after bud break is it flowering so, or yeah so after bud break you know shoots start to grow and then then you have flowering in the spring and um Flowering is what determines the fruit set for the cluster. So all the little tiny individual white flowers that you see are actually the berry, what the berries are, where the berries are going to be. So if you get um, a hail event or something that shatters the flowers, your clusters are actually going to be looser um, and there's not going to be as many berries. And that did happen to us um, in one of our vineyards in 2021. Um, and if, if you have like nice, calm, perfect weather, then you, you tend to get more berries because all of the flowers make it um, and are pollinated and, and create, the, create all the little berries on the cluster. And it's interesting because Shana told us that you can actually slice open the buds and take a microscope and see the clusters forming before they're even formed. And, and so here we have a little bit of a life cycle of a bud with its microscopic image underneath. And as you move through the evolution and stages of growth, you can just see how much more developed the cluster becomes and then the little teeny grapes that are gonna be down here at the end. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic from that yeah, standpoint. This this is a really Go good picture of a cross section of the bud. So um, you can kind of, so right now our Pinot Noir vineyard is somewhere between um, C and D. Um, oh, wow. Okay. It's swelling, yeah. So some of the vines uh, are, are closer to C, other ones are like D, they're almost ready to push and E is basically bud break, right? Uh, and if you cut the buds in half, you can see uh, the primary bud where the apical meristem is. So kind of like right in the middle, the, the, the part that the shoot is gonna grow the fastest. And then there's a secondary bud that's below it. And then uh, uh, another secondary bud or tertiary bud that's just above it. So if the first bud gets damaged, um, sometimes you can still get fruit because you'll have a secondary bud that will then create a shoot. And um, if it's fruitful, if there's little teeny microscopic clusters that are already there, um, then those will form and you'll still, you'll still get grapes on the vine. And Natalie, how much of this did you know before you came on board? So when uh, I decided to partner with Shana, I did start taking some classes at uh, UC Davis online, um, which, you know, it doesn't matter where you guys are located, you guys could all take those classes as well. And I learned a lot and it was just so mind blowing 
how um, the harvest, like the potential of the harvest is already predetermined from the previous year. Like it's, it's like stored inside the vine. Like that is so, so cool. Um, and uh, touching on one of the things that Shana said um, just a couple minutes ago, um, when the flowering happens and if there aren't any big weather events, um, that you get uh, that that damages those flowers you get so much fruit and you guys are tasting our 2018 pinot noir and that was a really heavy year in in napa valley um it was a super long harvest um right Shana, am i miss am i mixing up my vintages right now um well, 19 was longer but 18 was more fruitful 18 had a heavier set so heavier set that was it yeah um much much heavier set like everything picked really really heavy um, so everything was very well protected early season. Um, so it was pretty cool to see, um, year to year, the differences. And here's actually what you were talking about, Shana, with regards to the, the primary bud that comes out and then the two secondary buds mm -hmm. and these, these will throw fruit. So they can. Yeah. Um, it depends upon how healthy the vine is and how fruitful it is based on previous year's conditions. But yeah, so if, if the, the primary um, bud suffers damage um, and the larger secondary bud is not damaged because it's still basically dormant, uh, it can then grow a shoot and then and tendrils and um, have clusters. So however many little clusters that are predetermined inside the bud are there can then become, um, become fruit. So most buds are going to have between one and three clusters, uh, depending upon the fruitfulness. And the, how do you determine if, if it can throw fruit, each cluster is going to be different from a quality standpoint. How do you make the determination or talk to the growers and say, all right, I, I need to drop some fruit because these clusters are not as well formed as the primary cluster. How do you make that decision knowing that it's going to obviously impact yield? Yeah, so as far as this vineyard is concerned, it's a relatively small block. So I can actually go to the block and I can walk every single row and um, can even help out with dropping. So like I'll bring my secateurs and I'll just clip off ones that I don't like. And then I can also have um, Garvey Vineyard Management go through and do their traditional crop dropping where they might say, okay, um, you know, if, if there's more than two clusters per shoot, the, the higher cluster will drop, just sort of rule of thumb. Um, but it's, it's a relatively small block. So we can kind of go through and vine by vine, check it out and see which clusters look the best, taste the best, um, and then get rid of anything that we think is just actually uh, sapping nutrients and isn't necessarily going to make it into the final picking bin. And out of curiosity, because I would have thought the opposite is true. Why does the high cluster get dropped? So the high cluster doesn't always get dropped, but the high cluster would be the third cluster to form, right? Well, it's the first to shoot. It's the third cluster to form. So it's usually the smaller one. And oftentimes mm. you see like second crop, which is like way up high. Um, those, those like green ones, those will get dropped as well. So it's just sort of rule of thumb, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes that might be okay. the cluster, you know? Interesting. And Natalie, as a vineyard, do you see the economics of dropping fruit and, and feel pain or? <laughs> no, because I, I know, I mean, to be frank, we, we pay by the ton. So <laughs> we want to get, uh, we want to get uh, the best fruit possible and work with our growers to, um, you know, bring the potential of those wines uh, to fruition. Um, so we, we want it to be the best possible product. Well, and that's, I think that's an, you know, one of a dozen or more distinctions between limited production and smaller wineries than mass production wines. There's no one going through rows uh, for X, Y, Z, two buck chuck and, and dropping fruit. You know, they're actually picking fruit off the ground that may have fallen inadvertently and throwing that into the bin. So it's quite a big difference. And it's, it's funny because Pinot Noir and, and this vineyard source. And we, we talk a lot about vineyard sourcing at Cellar Angels. And in and, and my opinion, just about everything in life comes down to relationships. And, and, and Shana, you've been in the Valley now for a long time. So talk to everybody about, hey, how did you get access to this fruit that we're gonna show people? Some of them are more patient than others, Jeff and Jane, but we're gonna show people on Google Earth um, <laughs> where this vineyard source is. 
Sure. So um, I actually, before ever working with Natalie to come up with Guderian, um, was the enologist at Flora Springs Winery for about five years. And we made Pinot Noir from this block. Um, and I worked with the growers who are actually um, family that partially owns Flora Springs Winery. And um, they, um, I knew that they were, they were, they were getting rid of their Pinot Noir program. And so I reached out to Sean, who's the vineyard manager. And I was like, Hey, you know, I'm starting this project. I love making Pinot from this block. Um, can, can we make it, can we buy it? And he said, yes. And so, and, and he's really great to work with. Um, uh, the Garvey family, they're fantastic growers and they've been in the Valley forever. Um, and so luckily I already was familiar with this fruit. So I already knew somewhat how it would develop. And I had an idea of how we wanted to age it and this and that and the other thing, because I had a history of working with this block. And then um, it just so happened the year that we started our brand, we were able to um, transfer it to us and no longer to them. So we, we really got lucky with this. No, that's awesome. And, and I love that. I love the story of the vineyard selection of the Shannon Black, which by the way, very much like Jim Bocce. That's your new nickname, Jim. It's just going to be Jim Bocce. <laughs> Uh, Jim had a bottle of the Shannon to start with tonight, as did we had a bottle of the Shannon to start oh, with wonderful. tonight. And, and that, because we're not just features of the wine, we're actually customers. So we, we buy a ton of these people's wines because they are just so ridiculously good. But that's another scenario where that vineyard's been there a long time and you guys have access to the, th the fruit through relationships. Yeah. I'm telling you, it works. We talked about bud break. We talked about fruit set. Um, what are the other stages? I'm not, I'm sorry, yeah. not fruit shut, flowering. Flowering so, and then fruit set. Yeah. And then, and fruit set, which is directly correlated to flowering and then also warming. And then, um, and then after that, you just have ripening basically. So, um, depending upon your vigor, you may need to tip or top your vines. Um, you need to leaf, you need to let in some sunshine. Um, but you got to do it strategically because you don't want to get sunburn. And so, um, right just caregiving on the vines, um, suckering the vines, all that stuff um, through ripening. And then um, for the Pinot, we usually harvest um, mid-September. So I think September 18th is when we harvested on the 2018, unless I'm just remembering 18, because that's the year. Is it September 18th? Okay. Um, so it's usually right around then that we end up um, picking the Pinot Noir. And our um, as of right now, anything can happen. Um, seems like we have a very normal growing season so far. I shouldn't say that out loud. I'm going to knock on wood just so I don't jinx Wow, it. exactly. Everyone knock on wood. You need <laughs> Everybody knock on wood for me. Normal yeah. growing season. Um, so, so we'll probably look to, to mid-September of 2022 to, to harvest the 2022 Pinot Noir. Yeah, I think the and, earliest we ever harvested was the first weekend in, in September. But that was just because it was like an insane, crazy hot like 110 degree. <laughs> yeah. And you know, we did, we did an early pick for, um, our rosé, uh, which comes from the same vineyard, um, that we do a whole cluster mm. on. Um, but that, you know, it's an entirely different wine, even though it's the same grapes. So that one we do, pick, we do pick earlier. Cause we, we only want that to be at like, you know, 21 bricks. We don't really want it to be overly ripe. And Denise is actually going to turn on cameras and some of you will see familiar faces. Others of you will see a new face. We actually have an in-studio audience. Uh, if you are in town and you want to come in, uh, we take strangers off the street. This one happens to be an investor that was very curious where all her money is going to. And uh, she is joining us. But feel free to come on down to Naples. And so we're going to be turning cameras on so we can see everybody. But I do want to talk, Natalie, you talk, I mean, Shana just mentioned the nerve wrackiness of, you know, it was 110 degrees and stuff like that. Compare and contrast the nerve wrackingness of competitive athletics and having nothing in your control with mother nature and how it can impact everything that you're working on. Well, there, there's a lot of crossover actually, like with athletics, you put in all the work and you do, you control the things that you can control. And then you have to just kind of let go of the things that you can't control. So, um, that really correlates to the winemaking. Like we could, do our best to have good, like growing practices, um, make the wine as best as we can, um, really coach, coach the grapes to turn into wonderful, wonderful wine. But if there is a late hail, if there is a fire, if there is, 
this or that, like there's nothing we could do to control that. And so um, stressing about the things you can't control, um, it's it's inevitable, but you try to learn to control it as much as possible. Um, it, you know, like let go of, of that stress when you can't, you, you know, you have nothing to do with it. <laughs> No, oh, there's there's a little serenity prayer in there. I'm hearing. You know, you got to focus exactly. on the things you can control and and let go of the things you can't. Hopefully, you know the wisdom to the difference between them, uh, of which I just massacred the serenity prayer. But um, paraphrase. That's okay. Paraphrase. Perfect. It's cliff notes <laughs> of that prayer. But so I, I can uh, agree with the overlap and parallels to athletics because there is that's why I think winemaking is and farming in general is is one of the hardest vocations there is because there is so much of it that is out of your control and then having the tenacity and the ability to let go when something does go awry and figuring out all right how do we how do we turn this negative into a positive and there's so many things that, that Napa has faced in particular in the last several years that way out of your control um, so I'm thrilled that this is in the bottle. And I know there's Jim Bocci striking in the red ensemble this evening. Uh, Ju <laughs> Julie, good to see you. Uh, Rebecca is in studio audience. Bill, good to see you. Hans and Caitlin looking leisurely as ever. I like it. <laughs> Cheers. Nothing wrong with that. So let's show everyone kind of where this all takes place. And it's I love the fact that you pursued Pinot Noir. So, and I'm curious because you're in cab country. So why, why the pursuit of Pinot Noir? And I'll let uh, Shana take that one first. And then Natalie, I'd like you to follow up on any Pinot Noir anecdotes that you have. Cause it's from a Napa standpoint, it's, it's obviously Pinot's way down in the list as far as varietals grown in Napa. Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, Natalie and I both love Pinot Noir. So, I mean, that's, that's point one. Um, and then also when you're starting a wine brand, you have to think about um, all of the inputs that you need and then being able to sell it. And Pinot Noir does not need to age for 24 months. Uh, Pinot Noir ages for about a year and then you can put it in the bottle and then you can start to sell it. So we needed something um, that we were going to be able to sell because, you know, put our life savings into the company and then need to be able to sell the wine so that we can continue to make wine. And so because we both loved Pinot Noir, because I was able to get access to a beautiful vineyard, um, and then because we were going to be able to have a, a turnaround in a little over a year versus a little over two years, it made the most right. sense to start with Pinot Noir. Um, and we've gotten such a good response from it that I'm sure we're going to stick with Pinot Noir um, until forever, probably. We love it. We, we really love this vineyard and this is the only vineyard that we've worked with um, for the entire um, duration of our brand, Guderian. Um, and yeah, Sheena just touched on it um, that there, there were less inputs needed. So um, that trend, like one of those inputs is uh, finances. <laughs> so, um, you know, Pinot Noir is, is a little less expensive than Cabernet. And when you're starting a new brand, um, you have to build capital. And um, so we started with our Pinot. And I think another reason is it was er earlier ripening. And so Shana was working really, really hard um, throughout harvest with milk, you know, tons of other brands. Um, so this fit into the schedule. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that went into our choice, but first and foremost, we love Pinot Noir. Um, we know that this vineyard produces great Pinot Noir and, um, you know, it's a really food friendly wine. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the main reasons that I love it. Did you, Natalie, and you guys men both mentioned that you both love Pinot Noir. And so Natalie, you first, were there Pinot Noirs that you tasted that spoke to you that you were just like, okay, this is fantastic. And, and Shane, I'm sure you did as well, given, you know, kind of how you matriculated in the wine industry and tasted a bunch of wines. But was there an aha moment, Natalie, when you said, all right, uh, I think I like Pinot. I think I like Pinot a lot. Yes. And I distinctly remember that actually, um, because for the longest time, I didn't really get Pinot. Like I didn't, um, I think I was tasting some bad Pinots, um, to be honest. Um, and I was like, I don't get this wine, like why people like it. Um, especially, you know, the ode to Pinot and sideways, um, and, right. uh, you know, the movie sideways, um, and, um, 
it was when I did an event as a swimmer, um, as it was like an Olympic, it was right, right after I think the Beijing Olympics maybe. Um, and I went to Hawaii and it was the taste of Kapolei and it was a bunch of different vineyards or, or wineries were there. And one was Corneros de la Note. And um, I loved his Pinot. Like it was the first time that I was like, wow, I get this. I really, really like this. And um, it ended up being like one of the funniest experiences because I got um, his car, David Harmon. And Shane and I went and tasted with him in, in Corneros. And it was it, it like, it was literally him and his girlfriend in his backyard. Like I thought I was going to some like big, like Chateau <laughs> winery and it was like him <laughs> in his backyard. And that's so, I mean, that's just so like us, like, like Shana and I, um, it, it's, it's a pretty small operation that we run, we run. Um, so, um, a little different, but, um, we still love our Pinot. And Shana, any aha moments for Pinot for you? Um, I don't know if there's like one set mark. That was a pretty amazing <laughs> tasting though. I, I, I was just, I, I forgot the guy's name, David Harmon. We should look him up, Natalie, and see what <laughs> he was quite the no, And it's, it's a perfect <laughs> example about you, you remember experiences and. Oh, of course. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there, there's certain Pinots too, that like I, I gravitate toward and then, you know, making wine in Napa, uh, most of the stuff that I'm exposed to is Napa and Sonoma. And so like, right. I, I know outside of our Pinot Noir, of course, my favorite Pinot Noir is a Silver Eagle Pinot Noir that Mike Herbie makes. Um, and so I, I kind of almost emulate that because that particular wine brings me so much joy and I want to be able to bring other people so much joy, you know? Oh, so. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. And and you mentioned Napa and Sonoma, and that is the playground with which Cellar Angels focuses and it's the only place we focus. So the wine region for us is in fact, we, we've got Sonoma and we've got Napa and you, you can see just the proximity to the Pacific is you know, not accidental that it's a great wine region because every major wine region in the world has a maritime influence, everyone. I don't care if you're in the Nicaraguan, in Canada, in Bordeaux, in Burgundy, in New Zealand, Australia, there's a maritime influence. Napa and Sonoma benefit from that they are also a Mediterranean climate, which only 3% of the globe is a Mediterranean climate. So they have a certain set weather pattern, except for about the last seven years. It seemingly was set for a while, uh, but it does get a little bit out of kilter. We have to start taking you know, better care of Mother Earth. Uh, but this is where we focus. And it's, it's neat because uh, they talked about memorable moments and memorable experiences and taking care of the vines. And... Earlier this week, there was a birthday party in France for, and I'm going to read some notes here, for a wonderful woman of named Madame Lalou Biez Leroy. So if anybody knows Domaine Leroy, uh, Burgundy producer, we're going to take a quick trip and dizzy trip. So hang on to the fantastic Domaine Leroy in the Burgundy region. You've got Vosne Romani, you have Domaine Romanacanti. This woman turned 90 this year, and or I'm sorry, this past week, and she is credited essentially with putting Domaine Romana Conti on the map. She was 50% owner of, since I think 1974 until 1992. Uh, then she left because they had a difference of opinion with grape growing. She was all organic. She was all biodynamic. There will never be chemicals in her vineyards. She still owns a 25% stake in DRC, but then she went on and founded Domaine Leroy. Now, Domaine Leroy is probably one of the foremost Pinot Noir producers in the world. And if you have any of their bottles in your cellar, I will fly to your house right now and drink them with you. Uh, because she believes that and I'll, I'll quote her directly. There is no winemaking. There is no winemaker. We are merely guardians. We watch, we observe, we make decisions, but it is the grapes that come first. They guide us. Our job is to look, observe, try to understand. That is our job. That is our role. Yes, we make decisions, but we really don't do anything. One must love the wines, to, or the vines, to be near them, think about them, communicate with them. It is the only way that we can teach the vine and perhaps give them the beginning of consciousness to give them the feeling of being loved. 
I'm sure it applies to giving us beautiful grapes, tasty, real fruits of their land. It is these grapes deconstructed during the fermentation by yeasts contained in the bloom of their skin that give wines the image of their land and carries in them etched in their flesh like stigma, the essential characteristics of this deep earth. She's pretty poetic at the age of 90. And if you happen to have some of her wines in your cellar, the 2015 Chemberton Grand Cru is currently retailing on Vivino for $23,000 a bottle. So she knows what she's doing, but Shana, you talked about the way these growers treat this vineyard block was kind of what drew you to them. Uh, yes, definitely. Sorry, just doing the math. That one bottle, could get us 6.4 tons of beautiful <laughs> from Pinot Noir in Carneros. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, it's it's amazing that that's the price. And that's, you know, market driven, but they don't make a lot. She doesn't produce a lot of wine. And mm -hmm. Uh, very, very small. I think she has like 18 to 20 hectares of vineyards that she's been buying since the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Okay. Uh, she has, I think, five grand crews. It, it's incredible. But talk to us about why Pinot does so well in Caneros. Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, like you said, the marine influence is pretty important, especially in Carneros. You know, in Carneros, the, the, that region is primarily growing um, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and then there's quite a bit of really nice Syrah that grows there as well. Um, and it tends to be a slightly cooler area of Napa. As you drive north through the Napa Valley, the temperature will raise in the summertime during the ripening season. So it might be a beautiful 82 degree day in Carneros, um, which is beautiful ripening weather for our Pinot Noir. And then by the time you get up to Calistoga, it could be 92 degrees. So um, it, it's nice um, to have that, the cool breezes from the San Pablo Bay um, that kind of come up through the, you know, the way that the, the valley is arched, the cool breezes will blow up through the, through the middle there. And then also where our particular block is, it's kind of lower on a hillside, so we get a little bit more um, shade in the afternoon, which is great. So we get the morning sun to ripen, and then later in the day, we get a little bit of a, a shadow. So when it's at its hottest, it kind of protects um, our block a little bit. And so we don't get um, over ripening and sunburn and that sort of thing as if we, if we would get if we were on the, the top of the hill. And we also have that influence of the San Pablo Bay, so we might have more fog there um, than, than you would in other parts of the valley, which also is um, good for a Pinot. So now this is your block. Yeah, the baby. And do you, do, you get, <laughs> do you get the whole block or do you have 15 rows or? So we, we technically get the whole block. Um, we buy all the fruit and then one ton of the fruit goes to um, a small producer called Defiance Wine Company. Um, and um, that's uh, owned by, uh, by my production manager at Honeycut Wines. And so he, he has a tiny little Pinot project, but, uh, but we get the rest. So what we started doing this past year is harvesting um, a little less than half of the block early on for whole cluster press rosé. And then um, once the fruit ripens to about 24 bricks, then we harvest for the red wine uh, portion of the Pinot Noir. And so this is Pinot and this is Chardonnay. So that, that small, um, our, our block, so for 2021, the total uh, vintage uh, volume that we got was 4.7 tons off of that block. So it's not very much. And I mean, last year was a lower yield year, but in, even in a higher yield year, uh, because clone 777 has these small clusters, we might get five and a half tons, you know? So it's, it's really a, a, a small production um, coming off of that, that little section of the vineyard. And so what would 4.7 tons yield in terms of cases? Okay, so 4.7 tons times 145 gallons per ton divided by 2.4 gallons per case. You're looking at about 284 cases of wine, um, and which makes perfect sense because we've got about 125 cases of rosé, 125 cases of uh, Pinot Noir, and then um, there's going to be probably about 45 cases of the Defiance Pinot Noir that they're making off of that. So. 
fascinating. I, I love it when the math works. It doesn't happen often, <laughs> but I like it when the math works. Um, Natalie, Shana just said clone triple seven. And Sipsters know we did a deep dive on clones last year, as a matter of fact, when we were talking about Burgundy and just the different numbers of clones. And especially with Pinot Noir, you've got triple seven, you've got Dijon, you've got Pomard, you've got a lot of them. When she said that this was triple seven, did you have any preference with regards to, okay, well, I like a, a fruitier style of Pinot Noir. I want this to be more earthy or, or did you guys, did you just say, this is your decision? <laughs> Um, I left that decision up to Shana, but as um, we've worked together, I've learned why the triple seven is preferable, especially for a standalone Pinot. Um, and that's one of the things that I think we're really proud of, of our Pinot. It, it does have like some really nice savory characters. Um, it has that beautiful fruit of, you know, like raspberry and like, um, like black cherry, but it has that herbaceousness of when I said like oregano, I was thinking specifically of, the, of this wine um, and that earthiness um, that is, is really what I love in a good Pinot is having that backbone of that earthiness. And Shana, it's, I, I love that backbone and earthiness too. And a lot of times we refer to it from an adjective standpoint and, and now I'm always gonna be thinking of Natalie's tip to associate words with different things from a memory sense. You know, everyone says it's Burgundian. It has that forest floor. It has that wet earth component that, um, but but it is a, a heavier, musty might be strong, um, but it has that, that fresh organicness to it. Is, I mean, what drew you to triple seven? So, well, it, it wasn't even necessarily that it was specifically clone triple seven. It's just that the fruit sourcing from this vineyard, I had worked with it before and I loved the end product. So I also love Pomard clone, right? But that's gonna be a little bit fruitier, right? So with this one, I was I love the baking spice notes that always come from this location. And I think a lot of it has to do with the clone, but I think a lot of it has to do with the microbial terroir as well, right? So whatever the yeast are that are endemic in this vineyard, we use them to our benefit when it gets to the winery. We allow this wine to take off with the natural fermentation and ferment about halfway through before we add any yeast to it. Um, so we get a lot of the sort of floor notes to it. Almost there's there's a hint of a sherry character to it, um, which can kind of be attributed to wild yeast. Um, and then a lot of savory baking spices. It, it, it always reminds me of like baking at Thanksgiving and Christmas, like pumpkin pie yep. spice, that sort of thing. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of nice. If, you know, you want dessert, but you don't want dessert. Just have a, have a glass of Pinot Noir. And <laughs> no, the, the bacon spice thing is spot on. And, mm -hmm. and you can kind of imagine, you know, aromas coming out of the, the oven in the kitchen. It's like you mm -hmm. said around the holiday time and pie crust mm -hmm. and things like that. Natalie, I need you to, to, to give us the recipe that is a can't miss with this wine. Oh, um, my very, very favorite is a wild mushroom uh, risotto. Oh, it's um, so good. It's so, I mean, it's so, so good because then you could throw in, um, so like all of your favorite, um, wild mushrooms, like whatever you could get, like chanterelles, um, if you could get porcini's fantastic, um, and, um, like finish it off with some time, um, to really play with the like herbaceous quality. Um, and I think it's just like so, so good. And then a close second would be like a lentil stew, like a sausage lentil stew. Um, but with the wild mushroom, you could do vegetarian and the sausage and lentil stew for the, the meat eaters. <laughs> and earlier on, we had a poll question about Natalie potentially being a celebrity chef. Natalie is a chef and she's an author. <laughs> but not a celebrity. And, <laughs> and you're, you're, oh, you're a celebrity. Both of you are celebrities. So this is the Natalie cookbook cook to thrive. And she talks about kind of what we talked about earlier on at Cellar Angels, recipes to fuel the body and soul. That's what heroes do. They take their gifts and they share them with the world. So that is an impressive cookbook. Is that wild mushroom risotto recipe in here? Um, there's a version of it in there. So I think in there, um, I mixed it up and did like a farotto, um, where, okay. um, I, I took farro and then like crushed it up and turned that into a risotto. Um, and that was more because, um, it might be a little bit more nutritious, um, with the farro, but, um, or farro, um, but 
I would go old school and go with the arboreal rice with this one um, and just make it like as luxurious and creamy as possible. As decadent as possible. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and uh, Mission Control just put the recipe in the chat. Uh, the inscription that Natalie put in the book for Cellar Angels was extremely nice. I'm not going to read it. Um, there was no inscription. <laughs> I was like, was I as poetic as... Uh... <laughs> no, uh, I, it's hard for you to inscribe a book that we buy off Amazon. So it's really, I, I, Amazon's done a lot of things with shipping. I don't think they've shipped books to authors to then pick up and retrieve and then send back with inscriptions. But it's an awesome book. And I promise you the next time we talk, I'm going to pick a recipe out of here before we talk and I'm, we're going to make it and I'm going to send you pictures. I would love that. Because uh, the cookbook, I mean, everything Cellar Angels does is literally about feeding the soul. So uh, I love the subtitle to that book. And it's that recipe that's in the chat line is, or in the chat is fantastic. And the picture on the Cellar Angels website, it just looks decadent and, and just so savory. So I can't imagine, the, I mean, the silkiness of this wine would pair up fantastic with that. Mark, you are correct. That does sound more like Oregon. And I didn't say hello to you earlier, Mark. Good to see you again. <laughs> Who else have I missed? Um, tell me who wants to, I'll, I'll have Natalie, I'll pick on Natalie again. This little creature. It's a jackalope. <laughs> I love the name Guderian. Why the haunting um, logo? No, I'm teasing. He's so sweet. <laughs> so what are you talking about? Um, we have our mascot, which is our jackalope. And um, with our two main vineyards that we work with, um, Sunset Knoll and Carneros, and then the Pope Valley Vineyard, um, they have jackrabbits everywhere. And we love that. Uh, we like to imagine that they're really uh, jackalopes running through the vineyards, protecting the vines. Um, yeah, Shana suggested a, jack a jackalope as our mascot, and I think she was joking, and I was like, I love the idea. Yes, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> well, and I know Jeff and Jane are down in Arizona, and there are some tall jackrabbits down there uh, that they look maybe like small kangaroos when they stand on those hind legs and go trucking across golf courses. They're a little bit dangerous. That looks just like, they don't have antlers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. The offspring well, don't. But uh, the like jackalope... Oh, so sorry. Like I didn't want to interrupt, but like, no. like you said, like it, the cellar angel angels motto of serious wines, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. Like, I think the jackalope is a perfect example of that. Like it's a silly, like American mythology, um, thing that we love. Like, I think he's so badass and awesome. <laughs> I, I agree. And I, I think we should break some news this evening because when people now come to the Valley or very shortly, they will actually be able to taste with you. So Shana, why don't you tell everyone, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the timeline is, but I, I would imagine it's weeks versus months in that capacity. Yes. So talk to us about that. We're so excited. Yeah, so the goal is um, uh, late April to be able to start hosting people at our new spot. Um, we have moved our wines from St. Helena to Atlas Peak. Um, and we have, uh, it's, it's in a little 3,000 square foot cave. And at the moment, all it is is a cave um, and, and like a, a gravel road. Um, and then there's like a little gazebo. And so we're going to be hosting tastings um, basically on the side of a mountain overlooking the valley um, underneath a, a little gazebo. Um, so as soon as all of our permitting is transferred from St. Helena to the Atlas Peak location and the bathrooms are built, everyone is welcome <laughs> to, to come with an appointment um, and join either myself or Natalie or both of us, depending upon the day, um, for a tasting. And we can take you through our wines and maybe even do a little barrel tasting. And for those of you that don't know, I mean, Atlas Peak is on the southern end of the valley. It's a beautiful area. It is. It's spectacular. It does not look like that, people. Like, Hills are alive with the sound of music. Yeah. That's my sound of music backdrop. Absolutely. That was exactly what we used for sound of music. Very good. Uh, no, but so Atlas Peak is on the south end of the valley. I would imagine, what are you, from downtown Napa, 12 to 15 minutes if you miss one of the lights? 
So it's way up Atlas Peak Road. So oh, it's, okay. So it's, it's up there. It's about 25 minutes up the hill. If you, so it's the, like the closest main thing that everybody knows is Silverado Country Club because that's right at the base of Atlas Peak Road. And then you just yep. go there straight up the hill and it's about, a, from there, it's maybe about 15 minutes from the, from the country club. And from downtown, it's about 25 minutes. Nice. This is exciting. So uh, April, so then when we come out in July, we can all taste in the cave. Oh, we'll be, yes. And it'll be much cooler inside the cave. So um, yes, I, we would love to see you in July when you guys come out. There's actually some folks on here that will be attending and joining with us. And so oh, and cool. we put them and we put them to work yeah, beyond mission control. Um, but yeah, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, all right, just to give everybody and Denise is going to put some stuff. You, you'll find a recording of this episode. We need to also get uh, some musical entertainment. So if anybody knows anybody at Live Nation, I'd love to have someone just play music during the background because we can't use any music because YouTube sues us. Um, and, and those inputs, you're right, Natalie, those are not good inputs to have. Those are outputs, <laughs> those not good. Club wines ship on Monday for those of you that are Cellar Angels Wine Club members. And as we talked earlier about heroes, heroes have one thing, we'll, we'll, we'll end with Latin, confidence. Confidence is from the Latin phrase fidore, which means trust. And the fact that you've trusted us with the wine club, building a wine club module that in last year's fourth quarter, build everyone twice. So that was a fun module. Uh, it's a great for revenue, by the way, it's not good for customer sat when you build everyone twice. So we apologize for that. Uh, but thank you for having the trust in us that we will continue to deliver great wines to you and rectify any accounting errors. Uh, and actually in having trust in the folks like Natalie and Shana, that they too are pursuing their dreams, their passions. And honestly, you want to talk about wine heroes. There's no two greater wine heroes than these two that are sharing their gifts with the world. And all of us are, are better off because of it. So Cellar Angels, two weeks, we've got, or next week, we've got a taste of two Pinot Noirs side by side with father and son team from the Visley. But uh, go forward be good to one another, take the spirit and gifts that we all have been given and blessed with and share them with people and by all means, drink fantastic wine. Oh, thank you. Natalie Cheers. and Shana, thank you guys so much. Cheers. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Cheers.